it's, this is not a criticism, it's a statement that business has changed dramatically. Sure. And I feel very fortunate to yeah. have grown up, Picking up now. Yeah. You know, to have grown up in the industry when I did. And, I, I, and I'll summarize it this way. We, we came up in an environment in which we all knew what the goal was to find success and successful shows. But with it came an understanding that many of the times you may not succeed. And if you didn't succeed, you wouldn't have your head cut off. Today, the margin for being able to uh, account for failure and its impact on the various people that may be part of it. Nobody goes out to produce a failure. They always go out to produce success. You, they don't have much time to prove themselves anymore. We had the luxury of that within a reasonable period to show what you could do and know that you might, you're going to fail and learn to deal with it and learn from it and just don't repeat your mistakes. But uh, today it's much tougher. I'm just so thankful that I grew up when I did. Very lucky. Well, we were going to move to NBC, but I wanted okay. to say one more thing that we should ask about, because it, as I said to you off camera, it has great cultural resonance in that schoolhouse rock. Uh, you were involved as head of the children's program at the time that this was put on the air, if I understand correctly. Yep. It, uh, there is no more Saturday morning kids TV, but as late as there was such programming on, on broadcast, this was still airing. So the amortization rate <laughs> for these things is just stunning. Um, having said that, though, in those days when one put on the air programming that had a public service element or that was educational in tone and purpose, one did it to satiate the demands of pressure groups, of uh, the FCC, of whatever. One didn't really do it, I presume, for financial gain. So having said that, can you talk about the genesis of this very significant series of more or less like yeah. PSAs almost? Uh, let me just, uh, a little backdrop, okay? You're correct that in the early 70s, with the advent of PBS and the Children's Television Workshop and um, Sesame Street's emergence and the succeeding shows, the, there had been over the years various uh, groups, complaints about that the children's programming was not informative or educational in any way. It was just strictly for entertainment and to keep their eyeballs on the screen. And to a great extent that was true. Um, and the 70, early 70s provided a bit of an awakening of added responsibility. I mean, just remember that when you're sitting at a network, and it's still true today, although it's not very focused or dealt with in any way, each of these television networks exist primarily because of the 200 affiliates that, that are tied to them and who each have public licenses. And so your job in the network when you are operating is always, or had to be, or should have been, with an eye to realization that you had a big responsibility, not just to your affiliates that are your partners, but to the public, and that you're using the public airwaves for the process of disseminating the information and the programming that you're putting on. So keeping that in mind was always an ongoing factor in whatever I did. Um, that transformation in emphasis that occurred in those early 70s and the pressure put on the networks to now respond. If, it, if public television can do it, the networks can do it as well. Here is a perfect example of a very entertaining and yet informative show in the form of Sesame Street. And okay, yes, it was designed for the two to five year olds, which from a commercial marketplace standpoint was not feasible. There was not really enough advertising support to focus your programming on that, albeit we did use to focus on the two to fives to some degree, not exclusively, in the early parts of the schedule, like in the early hours of the schedule, up to nine o'clock. If we were on at eight, eight to nine, usually we made sure that those would have younger appeal to them as well as the six to eleven, so we could do it. Um, during that period of the 70s there, uh, Michael Eisner was the person in charge of the division, and Brandon was the second in command, and I was third. And the head, the, the network had an advertising agency in those days, 
and the head of the agency came in with two of his writers to see Michael, and we were invited into the meeting, and they, the, the head of the agency said, you know, I have a 10-year-old son who has a terrible problem in math. He's just got a real problem. We're trying to work on it, he said. But you know what? He's able to memorize the lyrics of every top 40 song. And he can do that. We should have a way of teaching him math. And out came number three. Three is a, three is a magic number. And they showed us the storyboard and how they wanted to do it and what it was. And it was obviously uh, uh, an, an inspiration. It was a moment, and everybody saw instantly the, the, the particular values of it, not just as a program, but now the question is, how do you take like three minute films and fit them into a very prescribed half hour format in which the shows are all cut for certain lengths? And you know, there are a lot of technicalities tied to how to get it done. And uh, uh, the process of doing that pilot film, the first one, The Three is a Magic Moment, was a great experience. Uh, the, t the, the agency guys were just terrific as writers and producers, and, and uh, um, uh, well, as the storyboard started to unfold on that first Multiplication Rock series, each one was, uh, 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 was fascinating. I, I remember one in particular, when they came in to see me about, uh, it was called Figure Eight. It was an ice skating routine, a young ice skater, and dealing with the circles of the eights and so forth. And, they were at the point where they wanted a voice for it. Now, one of the key uh, musical links for this show, or producers of this, um, this is where my senior moments are surfing. I'm trying to think of his name, and I blanked on it. Very, Bobby Duro, a jazz performer, Bob Duro, pianist and composer. And Bob was in my office with the producers, and he said, we have a singer that we want to use for this. And I could see they were very reluctant to mention it to me because they just didn't think I'd know who it was. And they finally said, it's a singer by the name of Blossom Deary. I said, perfect. <laughs> they just stood there and looked at each other. I had not expected that at all. She had this light, ethereal voice. It was just wonderful. And these kind of connections of both the, uh, the artwork, the aesthetics of the artwork, the childlike nature of it, the, 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 uh, the, everything just kind of fell in place. And it was just a great, great time. And, and it was quite effective, obviously, as we know, it's still around. Jack Sheldon, of course, oh. did several of those. Oh, God, yes. So interestingly, the aesthetic of these is so elevated, not yeah. only the subject matter, not that, this, not that multiplication yeah. is elevated, there, but I, the I don't want to take credit for all of those spin-off series. There were other executives who were involved as well. Uh, after I left the area, they continued. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it was, a, it, you know, the, the one thing I, I, I always have had a hard time in this kind of process talking about is I did or I did that. It's never that, it never is. This is a collaborative medium sure. and it requires the collaboration of a number of individuals and areas for things to come together. It's a, there are two fundamentals of the business that get lost to many people when they get into the inertia, the, 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 not the inertia, but the, uh, the, the, the um, all of the small details that go into the business. Yeah, minutia. Mm -hmm. The concept of creation and execution. Having the idea is a beginning, it's not an end. Now comes the task of how to make it work, what, how to build it out, what is it, where is this breathing room, where is storyline going, what is the, how do you take the conceptual idea and translate it into some reality in the forms of its execution? And the success has to come from both parts. Noting that this was, uh, you know, it introduced children to uh, not only educational things, but some of the great jazz and pop interpreters. It's a, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's fascinating mix. It's children's fair far beyond anything else that would be on ABC at the mm -hmm. time. Um, it had to cost a lot, I'm sure. It's better, it's better than, the animation is better than average for the programming right. of the time. 
uh, it, the, 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 the musicians, etc. Was there any hesitancy to say, yeah, this is great, but boy, this is going to cost a lot of money and we can't really pay well, for this and it, it's not, you know, we can't sell it? Look, and, there had to have been discussions at yeah. one point or another. I can't sit here and say absolutely not. But they, I don't remember them having any really... Uh, they weren't roadblocks to the process. Now it was a question, how do we make it work? First of all, they were ABC produced. They're owned by ABC. So there was some back-end benefit that they would accrue. They, could they never getting, anticipated how much yeah, and how long live this would be. Yeah. But um, the, 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 the hard part was grappling with how to do them and integrate them into the schedule enough so that, that we wouldn't destroy the underpinnings of the financial formula for the schedule. Um, and um, we kind of figured it out, and, and, and uh, it became easier once the, the basic formatting of how we could get them done and how they, and then, you know, the expansion into the various other areas of Grammar Rock and um, uh, uh, I've forgotten also Grammar and, and, and history and, and, and there was some science elements of uh, uh, Gal government, the Gov bill. Civics, yes. Oh, the, uh, Jack Sheldon. I mean, it's yes. just a bill. Yeah. That's right. I mean, so, just just thinking of it, just I, I got tingles whenever they would start some of these things. Yeah. Okay, so 1977, you go to NBC. Well, there's something else. I want to back up because there's another do. series that gets lost in this that was a breakthrough that I had the good fortune of being a part of at various levels, as a director and as an VP in charge. It was. In that environment of where we were now beginning to shift our head more towards how can we diversify what we do and play to not necessarily just the young audience, but the teen audience as well. And what emerged was the ABC After School Specials. I and I feel very mentioned. proud of those, quite frankly. Uh, not just me, but those who, it was, it was an original idea of Michael Eisner's, to give him credit. Um, he. <laughs> He didn't know what he was getting into, but he wanted to go before the affiliates with something. He, he had been used to prime time scheduling and, 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 and speaking before the affiliates where there's also a lot of change and a lot of things to talk about. Well, in daytime and children's programming, there isn't a lot. It doesn't change that dramatically and that frequently. And he was going to speak before the audience of the affiliates, and he wanted something new to say, and he just said, let's do some specials. He had no idea what they were going to be, but it was still his idea to do that. And Brandon is the one started as the real creative force that brought those into play with regard to what we're going to do. And I loved working with him on those. And then eventually I took over and did a couple of the specials and during the time that I was still in charge. And um, it, um, they, they, they were terrific. The, the, the greatest thrill for me, one of the greatest thrills for me, was some of the letters that we would receive from parents on those specials um, that would almost, mostly all go along the lines of how thankful they were that we were doing this, that we were touching subjects. They couldn't bring themselves to interact with their children and these served as the catalysts to enable that kind of level of angst and, 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 and the various subject matters of problems that the kids in those years would be facing to have some dialogue with their parents. And it, we knew we were doing something that nobody else was doing. And that made us feel really good. Felt we were really making a contribution to our profession. And these are, uh, these deal with the controversial social themes, adolescent mm -hmm. development. Sometimes they are adopted, adapted from important books in some cases. Yeah. So uh, you know, this touches a lot of... Most were original, so most were original scripts from, from, uh, um, from original conceptions. So this deals with a lot of things that most of your other children's programming... Totally different. Yeah. Totally different. With a different mindset and a different focus, different objective. Um, and uh, uh, it, it was a... It, uh, they moved me. They moved me, and there are very few things that really do move us. It isn't just a matter of success or failure, but where you could sort of look at yourself and kind of, okay, that was a good one. Mm -hmm. So, 1977, you go to NBC. ABC, you've come from ABC, which is, as we discussed, was a network that was 
although gaining traction, was a, was a third network, certainly. It was not in a dominant position in, in many cases, although that was changing. It was dramatically changing. Yes. It, it, uh, it was in the 70s where the enormous amounts of success in a number of the areas came about. That's when Charlie's Angels happens, and that's when the, the a whole Monday roster Night Football of and all these lovely things. Oh, well, some wonderful things, and and they they really moved themselves into a true equal competitive position, and and even to lead over the other two. Well, interestingly enough, in 1977, you go to NBC, and NBC, which had been a network with great history and great dominance yep. at one time, Absolutely. was at a moment uh, that was not one of its best moments, mm -hmm. uh, ratings wise. There was great tumult at that time. There was. Uh, <laughs> A lot of changes at the top of the network. Uh, the news division, the presidents changed three or four or five times in just a few years. So you, you went into a situation that was, uh, again, kind of a less than dominant situation, I would think. Uh, it made me think of one incident, two, that I will talk about that speak to that. In looking reflectively back on the career, I have to look at both the successes and the failures. And what I failed to be able to do in my early stages at ABC, in the early years of being in charge, I had difficulty working with a certain personality that was running the division. Okay? And he wanted me replaced, but certain individuals there didn't want to see me go. So they arranged for a job for me on the West Coast. This is unbeknownst to me, okay? When I was finally told of the desired change, it was like on a Friday afternoon, and this is the decision that's been made, and we need to hear from you by Monday whether you'll accept the position on the West Coast. Now, I had been planning prior to that a realization. I wasn't oblivious to the conflicts that were going on, but I began to sense that the probability was that any next move that I would make would probably need move to the West Coast. And I was preparing my wife and family for that possibility. Now I had just thrown it. So I moved out to the West Coast on a, in a job that I could do with both hands tied behind my back because I had done it before I was in the program department and it was running the production and the lot here at Prospect and Talmadge. And it, by fortune it came out at a time just before there was a big NABET strike, and so it was, uh, my skills were really, really helpful, a little more than they had been anticipated, no one anticipated the strike. But I remember during the time there, I was out here for about six months or so, when a friend of mine said that NBC wants to talk to me. And that's when I went in for the interview with the guy I had mentioned earlier, who's asked me that brilliant question of, well, what do you attribute to your success? And when I realized that they were serious and that they were going to hire me, I had to call the ABC people and let them know. And I knew there was one person in particular that I was very, admired very much. He handled himself extremely well on a number of issues. And you know what? As I think about this, you know the way you asked me the question earlier about how the instincts of how did I learn this empathy and working. I learned it from this guy to a great extent. I just realized that as I'm sitting here, as I'm thinking back, because I watched how he handled people. So I called him up first. He was the head of the whole, like president of the company. And I called him up and I, and you know, I was, I felt like a kid was leaving the family. I had grown up there. I'd been there 14 years or more, actually more. This. If you count the years that I worked part-time during the summers and the two and a half years before, I actually had been there for 20, 21 years before I left. Started in 56 yeah, and then leaving in 77. And so it's like leaving the family. It was a very emotional time for me. And yet I knew it was necessary. And I called him up and I explained the situation, et cetera, et cetera. And so he started to prod me. I was being a little more holding back on what was going on. And he said, you want to tell me about where you're going and what's going to happen? And so I decided, hell, I'm going for it. So I told him, and this is what they're hiring me for. And there was this long pause. And he said to me, Michael, 
you've done a great job for us over these years, and I'm never going to forget it. But you better be careful. The management's a little shaky over there. <laughs> and I went over to NBC, and it was around Thanksgiving time. I remember that, maybe just before it. And I, this was while I was here on the West Coast now. This was a West Coast job, and I was already out on the West Coast. And they wanted me to come back that Monday morning after the official hiring, it was like two days later, to have a big meeting in New York. And I go in to the, the meeting in New York, and all of the various NBC personnel are there, not just for meeting me, they had other subjects they had to talk about. And we got to daytime, the then head of the network, and said, we just hired Michael Brockman, and he's responsible for Family Feud, et cetera, et cetera. He's given me a big buildup. And he turns to me, now I'd been there two days, and he said to me, and we really have some problems in the daytime schedule. Michael, do you have any recommendations of what we can do now? And I sat there, and I stopped, and I'm saying to myself, is this a joke, or is he serious? And I realized, he's serious. And then I remembered the comment that the ABC guy told me about the management being a little shaky. So I had a feeling what this might all be about. And I decided, I am not going to be a part of this crazy game. I'm going to tell it like it is. And I got up and I said, yes, gentlemen, I have a recommendation. You do? I said, yes, we're going to do nothing. And that'll be the first improvement that you'll have made in about a year. Because I figured, i got nothing to lose. I am not going to get trapped by this. I talked to you about that when you make a mistake, it, you're anxious to correct the mistake, and you can end up making bigger mistakes. And that's really what had happened there. And I just said, you're going to have to give me six months. In six months, I hopefully will have something productive to want to put on the year that will improve something that's on, but not before then. Are you, and I got pressured. Are you sure there isn't something? And I said, I've given you the best advice I can give you. If I had an answer that would satisfy your question in a way we could do something now, I'd be happy to offer it. But having just gotten here two days ago, I don't. There. Wait. Go ahead. Within weeks, that guy got fired. And the guy whom I left at ABC is brought over to NBC. And I'm going to have to deal with him again. And Dick Clark and I shared a similar experience with this individual, which I can get back to on with Dick, but at the moment, let's stay with the movement. I've been talking a long time here. Um, now, I was there for a little over two years and did not have time to really... Uh, I made some improvements in the morning with a couple of game shows that went on that did fairly well, Card Sharks and High Rollers, or revised version of car, High Rollers, but, but nothing of any significance. And with the soaps, there really wasn't enough time to, to, uh, to do a lot, but we, we, we made some improvements in a couple of the shows. But nothing, as I said, of newsworthy note. There is a figure looming atop all of this uh, whose name you, because of your great uh, civility, have chosen not to mention, but for the purposes of the history of those who might choose to watch this programming. Um, they could figure easily who that would be because uh, he was the wonderkin, so-called, who was yeah. the head of all three networks yeah. at one time. I'll mention his name. I'll mention his name, and then I want to explain the circumstances. Okay. okay? I said to you earlier on, that this is a business made up of a multiplicity of personalities coming at problem solving from very different ways. In my early years, where I was in charge, where I did not have the breadth of experience to train me properly on how to deal with a more combustive kind of personality, I failed in learning how to communicate with them. His name is Fred Silverman. He's still around, he's a very successful producer, and I'm going to tell you something I've said to his face. Even though it was a difficult number of years that I worked for him, I learned a lot from him, and I really did. There are many areas of scheduling, of promotion. Um, uh, his, his concentration on problem solving until he felt that he had reached a point of problem solving, his, his discipline in, in staying on something to do that, which sort of belied the, the kind of compulsive 
uh, explosive kind of aspect of his personality. But all of these things were things that were great learning experiences for me. It's not fun when you're on the spot and you're on the center of the attack, but you got to learn to deal with that. It's part of life, and you have to. So in recent years, I happened to come across him once or twice, and, and once I went over to him, and he was standing with his wife, and I went over and I said, Kathy, and I introduced myself because I hadn't really met her before. And I said, I used to work for your husband. And I said, but I wanted to say, he, was, he didn't know what I was doing. He thought I maybe it was going to come out and do something terrible. I don't know. And I said, look, I just came over here to say thank you because I said, even though we had a difficult number of years, I did learn a lot from I, and from you, Fred, and I really did. And I meant it. And it was a cumulative learning experience that has helped me in my subsequent career. So. This is noteworthy, and we talked off camera earlier about the fact that we do interact in our lives and sometimes work with people who have very divergent personality mm -hmm. types, and it can be very, very challenging. Um, despite you being such a person of diplomacy, as you appear to be, and so measured and thoughtful, occasionally someone comes up against a person of such divergence that it's nearly impossible to interact with them. It's true. Uh, the famous Robert Henry quote from The Art Spirit when he says, you pass people on the street, some are for you, some are not. So this sounds to be a person who simply was not for you. How did you, obviously you say you learned from it, How? because you had to deal with that for extended years of time in, in these two different jobs. How did you manage to strike a balance and keep working? Well, he and I made amends when he first joined NBC. And in his own way, you, you know how we have a president at the moment who has a hard time uh, accepting responsibility or admitting a mistake? He does not take advice well. Okay. Yeah. No, not advice. He, when you ever hear him come he out and say, I didn't make the right yeah. decision or this mm -hmm. was a mistake, whatever reason, his mantra is he doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. It's up to him. Fred had his way of doing it, but it was done a little differently. Not similar. So mm -hmm. When he was first joining NBC, and he had been frozen out from starting there for six months, because when he got hired, he was still on a contract at ABC, and there were six months to go for his contract, and they were very upset about what he did and therefore refused to release him from his contract, which certain parties thought he would do. And so they forced him to like go to, my, to, the, to Hawaii for six months and disappear because he was still employed by ABC. Well, I was there at NBC all during that six-month period, and people were going crazy. They were in a lame duck situation. And they would come over to me to find out what they're in for, and I just said, look, guys, I'd love to be able to give you the answer, but I never solved it satisfactorily for myself. I was, n I, he got rid of me. I said, I, I can't give you any good answers. I never found them for myself. When it was just about time for him to start at NBC, like it was coincident to the start of an affiliates meeting in New York in June, and th his first official day was on a Monday, which is the first day of the meeting, but we were rehearsing over the weekend. So I said to one of the folks, I said, is he coming in to watch rehearsals? And they said, oh no, he's strictly adhering to the contract. I said, really? Okay. Well, I went in for Sunday rehearsal and the news division was up and I was, this was at Radio City Music Hall and I'm at the back of the, the, the audience and it's dark and I'm saying to myself, he's gonna show, I just know him. He is going to show his curiosity about how things work here is gonna be such. He's not gonna get up there cold on the stage on the Monday without getting some idea what's going on. And all of a sudden, out of the back of me, from behind me, I hear this voice that I don't see anybody wears. He looked and he says to me, well, you never used to dress that way at ABC. Because I was dressed in jeans and a shirt. It was a rehearsal, you know. And I recognized the voice right away and I turned around and I said, welcome, Fred. And he said, and we had a nice chat and that was that. And he was trying to create an atmosphere of, okay, it was then and now's now. He got up to make a speech that Monday. And when he got to daytime, he just said something to this effect. The changes that have been made here in the last six months have been sensational, and I'm sure we're on the right. It was his way of apologizing, okay, in a constructive way that he could deal with. And I recognized the message, and that was terrific. And 
So for a certain period of time, everything was fine. Because I knew he had a zillion problems because he was coming in as president of the company. And he wouldn't get around to daytime for a while, so I knew six months to a year would be okay. But I knew eventually it might become troublesome again. And eventually it did. And um, the thing that finally broke the camel's back, so to speak, was I hear that he's committed to a 90-minute daytime show with David Letterman. No, no, it was an hour show with David Letterman and a half-hour news program. I think that's what it was. I don't know if it was. Nice. It was one of. The, but it was with David, and I knew David. David had had been a game show host with Bob Stewart. Was it just and a, a pilot, pilot, or was it, it was a pilot? Series. It was a pilot, yeah. and it had done just prior to my arrival, and uh, Bob was trying to revise the format when I got there, and he had David in front to do some um, rehearsal, and. Um, and I got to meet David and I saw his acerbic personality and his, his, I mean, did I foresee his future in this way in which it, it, it expressed itself? No, wish I did, but I didn't. And I know I had gone around to a couple of the departments at NBC to say, you got to see this guy. I, I'm not sure how to use him, but you got to see this guy. And I wish I had had the foresight about uh, late night, but then Fred puts him on in daytime. and because he had seen the pilot in, in, in a talk format. And I, I just said to myself, this is going to be a big disaster. There's no way this kind of a show is going to work in daytime. But I've been committed to. And I said to myself, oh no, I've been there. I'm going to do this again. He'll, you know, I'll be the messenger. I'll get the blame. So I knew I had to leave. And so I did, and I went over to a production company for about two years, and then an industry strike forced them to let everybody go who didn't have a show on the air, which I didn't at that point. And then along came CBS. Well, that's the next thing to ask about, Laura Mar. Before we do that, you mentioned Card Sharks, Randy. Anything about the games of that era at NBC that interests you to ask about? You mentioned two, you put, putting two new games on. Well, I said Card Sharks, Sharks, and then a revised version of High Rollers went yeah. on the air. Um, Is this the first incarnation of Card Sharks with yeah. Jim Perry at this point? Yeah. Okay. Yep, and uh, it, uh, it it was a compressed period of time. It's not. I don't look back as fondly on the NBC days as I do ABC and CBS. So anything on those at all? I just keep well, going. In general, uh, how much does the network uh, offer suggestions in the development phase, uh, or do you say, "Hey, it's Mark Goodson"? I'll just oh no, 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 no. But you mean at that time? Yeah. Oh no, I was very open about uh, details of what was presented, but um, the second guessing Mark Goodson, in far as it's not say if you're second guessing, okay, yeah. if you're saying, but it goes back to what I had said to you about the time when I said to him, "I'll give you a pilot, but don't bring it to the stage until you're ready." Okay, I. Um, If there were questions, I would put them in the form of questions. You know, I'm not quite sure I understand element X or element Y. Is this what you're meaning to communicate when you're doing this? I, I, you know, I would try and find ways that were not, um, didn't force defensive positions in hearing it. It was a conversation. Detaching yourself from the structure, not attacking the person. You're dealing with the idea. and whether the idea worked as well as it might. What if you tried X? Or they would, might say, we tried that and it didn't work because of Y. Or, but it was a conversation. It was never, you know, fix that, it's lousy. I mean, I, I, the, the professionals, you don't have to deal that way. Was there anything in the format of Card Sharks that you recall needed to Here's what I remember about it. I remember it was an energetic show. It was a relatively... I don't want to say simple idea, a, a relatively narrow structured format and process, okay? But what I said to myself was, while I may not have thought it might be a big hit, it would be a great way to open the morning. A bright, lively half hour that has dramatic points and beats to it and kind of like revs up the engine to go for the day. You have to think about how it, 
viewers are going to interact with the show, not just as a participatory skill, but what time of the day are they interacting with it? You didn't see soaps on in the morning because they were required much too levels, too deep a level of concentration to fully appreciate them. And that's no one's going to have the time at home to be able to do that because that's really what your target audience is, the women that weren't in the workforce as much as they were as, over these last 20 years. Is there any, we, we touched this a moment ago, but I guess because I find Jim Perry an intriguing MC. Yep. Um, how much role would you play or would someone in your position play in shaping who ended up as the host of these various games? Again, process. Producers bring us over, once we've committed to a pilot, now trying to cast the MC. And you would see run-throughs with an individual talent, with reactions to them, good or bad, and then have a discussion with the producers. And if the producers felt very strongly about somebody, uh, I would never really override them. Again, they had more at stake than I did. So. Uh, Mark Goodson wanted to use Dennis James for the daytime Price is Right, and Bud Grant said, no, Bob Barker. Um, um, Seems like a, 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 a far greater. I can't uh, to see comment that. on that because I was not part of it or present, so I don't know. Okay, uh, Bob's name came up. Jerry told me that. Um, let me try and remember. I know it's because of truth. And the truth of consequences, and uh, that someone had seen Bob and, and, and had sense that he might be right for it. I, I cannot I know whom to attribute Bud it to. Was, Bud, was, I'm sure was, Bud was involved because Bud... Bud well, he was champion. Bud and I, were, were, as it turned out, were of, of somewhat similar in, in manner and style. And, and, and so that's why we got along so well at CBS. You have expressed in conversations off camera that in making decisions regarding a pilot for a game, for example, you did not particularly concern yourself with whether the personality was a known name or not. Oh, now, no, not at all. Now today, as you well know... Well, wait, wait, let me, wait, let me, let me qualify that. That's not exactly do. true. That's not exactly true. First and foremost was the skill of the MC and that person's talents as it fit the format, mm -hmm. okay? That's the, the, the first overriding consideration. There is value if it's an established name personality, but never any certainty of success. It's a false comfort. It just know that the skill of the individual is there to do the job. You're taking a somewhat of a risk if you're doing it with somebody new whose potential may not get realized from the forms that you see in the early stages, where you don't have to worry about so much with an established personality. You know what there's their strengths are and their weaknesses. So that's well, the only way I think is the accurate, more accurate way to describe it. Having said that, we, we know that you mentioned of some games that have, are coming on the air in short for short runs or uh, it's more or less like mini series or yeah. specials, ones that have been done in recent seasons. One doesn't go to the air with a game today without a big name, right? Well, you, had a different, you have a different mindset. Well, okay. I recognize that. So two, two things, two specific things. When the shows air now, if it, and particularly where the shows are coming back is in prime time on like a once a week basis, mm -hmm. you're looking at that as a once a week entity and you are in today the dramatic need for visibility. Getting the audience to be aware of the fact that you're on the air is a much harder job than it was back in the 70s, a lot harder. Number one. And number two, you're working on a show five days a week in daytime, not once a week as in prime. That's another different dynamic that you have to weigh and measure. It also impacts the idea itself. Some shows may have an ability to work under short burst circumstances, but if they were under the, uh, the microscope of being on, in those days, 52 weeks a year, we didn't run repeats either. You had to make sure that the idea had legs. So there are, there are different measurements of measuring both shows and, and the talents that go with them. Yeah. It's, it, 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 it's a much heavier demand of getting immediate attention. We had the benefit of 
a little time. When I say a little time, I mean not years, but if you would put a game on, you would pretty much know within six months whether you had something that was going to stay and where its levels were and where it was going to go. You, you had a better understanding of what the longevity of the likelihood of the longevity of the show was. Today, you're on in short, you give you five, four, five, six episodes, and you got to make it in that span or it's history, your history. Very tougher, tougher climate now. Before we leave NBC, anything else about NBC? Okay. Briefly, you, you say it's very brief. You mentioned 1980. Joined Lorimar as VP with primary purpose of getting them into first run syndication. Yeah. Now, Lorimar at this period is in the midst of, or in some cases at the end part of, some great success with some very big shows. Dallas is on yep. the air. They Lots had the landing. Waltons. They've had some great stuff. But this is all prime time. Falcon Crest. Yes. And so others. What were their ambitions? Waltons. <laughs> Waltons, yes. Mm -hmm. What were their ambitions in first run syndication? What had happened is they, uh, the two individuals who headed it, um, were coming from the advertising fields in one part, and uh, I'm trying to remember where. Well, they, they, they were concerned about the fact that the syndication of these primetime soaps which had not yet started. They were very reluctant to have to walk into a syndicator and make a deal with a syndicator and give them 35% of, the of the profits, of, of, of the, the revenue of, uh, of what the shows would sell for. And they decided to set up their own distribution company. They felt they were skilled enough and could get the skills necessary to be their own distributors. They then realized that beyond the syndication of their own shows, they would need more product to support the pipeline and the overhead of the distribution company. So they hired me to get them into the fringe areas that they didn't get into. So that's what I was brought in to do, and that was in about 1980, 1981. So in asking, may I, am I correct in understanding that what you're saying is they were more interested in getting placeholder programming, getting into the marketplace, than actually having big successes in first run. Is that oh, correct? No. no. They were very okay. success driven. This had okay. nothing to do with just the stabilization okay. of, of, a, of an overhead situation. They wanted success in these other areas and they had a very high sense of themselves and their ability to do it. And uh, I had somebody doing some touting for me to them from William Morris. And uh, I interviewed and uh, I will tell you another quick story, which is a Please bit of humor about this for the interview. Um, the two partners are Lee Rich and Merv Adelson, okay? And Lee is the one that agreed to hire me as the head of television. He said, I'd like you to go meet my partner, Merv. He knows about you, et cetera, et cetera. And I went in to meet Merv. And a handshake and so forth, and he very, very well dressed, and very stylish, and really, really cool guy in a multiple ways of defining cool, okay? And he said, I heard a lot about you. He said, he looked at me straightforwardly and he said, how long do you think before you can get a show on the air? There's another one of these moments. So I sat back and I said to myself, is he kidding? Or is he serious? So I looked at him and I answered him. I said, maybe never. I said, I have no idea. I said, that depends upon what I discover, what we, what we create, what your sales department will be able to sell. He said, you're not selling a network now where it's one sale, it's 200 sales. You gotta go to every station now. I said, so I'd love to be able to give you a concrete, precise answer, but I can't. I got hired. <laughs> so, but they, but they, they were very financially driven, and I respected that, not in an unreasonable way. We did two pilots during that first year. Um, here again, my lack of real sophistication of understanding the syndication market was the causation of one of them not getting on air because it was a terrific pilot. Um, I like to look at the marketplace and that includes obviously not the creative aspect of it but the, the, the end result of, the, of the, the stations and where the station needs were. And I looked at one day part because I knew how competitive Prime Access was at that point and uh, Wheel and Jeopardy were already pretty much established around that time, which is a whole other story, fascinating story. But 
I said to myself to jump into that marketplace, the likelihood of failure is too great. I don't know that there's going to be any time period availabilities enough with all the competition that's going on for us to jump in there now. So let me look somewhere else. And there was a show on the air for like 20 some odd years on the weekends called Lawrence Welk. And I said to myself, okay, there's a show that has existed under the radar for years. He's getting older. That's a very specified, targeted audience. If we do a slightly younger version of that, we might be able to find a niche. I got Dwight Hemian and Gary Smith, very well-established variety producers. We did a pilot with Doc Severinsen with two wonderful singer talents, Clint Holmes and Ann Gillian, who is a terrific actress but also a great singer. And we did one hell of an hour pilot. There's one thing I forgot. There were time periods the stations didn't care about. They, they, they were focused on the high profit margin areas for themselves. This was, those fringe hours, unimportant. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't get, we couldn't get their attention. Just couldn't. And it was sad, but that was the reality of the business and I should have realized that. And the other one, there's another interesting thing, and it brings Chuck Barris back into play although we didn't work with Chuck. Um, Dick Clark and I together put together a talk format which was the predecessor of The View. Um, I'm trying to remember what we called it. It was, it was a show that had been on the air many, many years before. Dick had acquired the rights to it. I'm blanking on the title. But the format involved two women and a guest fella being grilled, okay? Hmm. And we were going forward to do a pilot and the sales department wanted to try and sell it for cash to the stations. Chuck Barris, getting wind of this, puts together his own version of the same show. Straight barter. Straight barter. Guess where the stations went? <laughs> How likely would it be for a new syndicator to come along with non-traditional programming and say, oh, by the way, you got to pay us for it and expect them to take it? Is that, is that something that would realistically happen? <sighs> Not in that day part. Yeah. Not in that day part. So why was it done? That was outside my control. Okay. okay. But in fairness, because I did not have as deep a level of experience at that point in the details of that marketplace. Mm -hmm. I had no real standing to disagree. I, the minute I heard that Chuck was doing a pile of the same thing with a, with a barter, I knew we were dead, mm -hmm. and for why we would be dead, even though I thought we did a better version of it. But the host, by the way, was Alex Trebek. For, you, <laughs> for your version or for yeah. the Bears version? Yeah. Uh, did the Barris version succeed in any, any measurable I, way? I, I'm blanked on the title of it. I, uh, oh, God, my mind is really losing me. I didn't think I'd lose these titles, but my mind is finally showing it. Um, it went on for about a season. It did not last very long. But um, uh, I thought Oz had a little more, um, a little better taste. Let me put it that way. I can imagine. Yes. Okay. But... It didn't happen. That's life. You know, as I used to say to students whenever I would teach at a lecture, I said, uh, college, graduate students, I, I would say something to this effect. Um, you're going to have to learn. I see all your, your very bright, eager faces and anxious to get out into this business and put your mark on it, and I respect that and I hope you're successful. I said, but I have to warn you about something. He said, there's a very specific word you're going to have to learn to deal with in the course of your careers. I said, the word is failure. I said, because 90, 95% of your ideas are going to fail. And I would be a little more explicit about it, et cetera, and I would watch these smiling faces begin to turn and get a little worried. And when I thought I had the moment, I would say, now, you might wonder why would I want to get into a business if I'm going to have to encounter all of that failure? And I said, the reason you're going to do it is for the other 5 for 10%. For it makes up for it. <laughs> you just got to work at it to find it. And uh, the same thing is applied what I'm talking about here. If you don't go in recognizing that 
not going in designing to fail, but the odds of succeeding are very small. It's part of the business. The failure is the show, it is not you. So despite your great background in game programming, there was not an ambition specifically on the part of Laura Moore that you would create game programming for her. Is that correct? We didn't ever get to that specific. Uh, it wasn't excluded, but I felt, I thought at the time, with the format that was in discussion for daytime, the, 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 um, the talk format was just sort of emerging at that point a little bit. It hadn't really taken root the, the way in which it is over these past number of years. And I felt the idea was novel enough and engaging enough and fun with Alex as a host and Dick as a producing entity that, I mean, I knew enough about the syndication market that I was playing to a much broader base series, of, which is the program directors and general managers of the stations. And yes, the economics have to work out, but it would be a better appeal to them than a game that they might get from a network. So I hadn't forgotten it by any means because I love the form, but I didn't think it was the right way to start. But I had to keep in mind the quality of the Lorimar name, and I wanted to maintain that brand. I didn't want to have to do anything to undermine that. Um, and, and so with Dick Clark producing one and, and Dwight Hamilton and Gary Smith, we, we had classy producers on our hand who I knew would do good shows, and it turned out we did do two good pilots. But then a, then a strike hit shortly thereafter, and, and I was let go, as did everybody else on the staff who wasn't tied to one of their existing network shows. So, 1982, and I said, this is great game programming and ki kids things, everything. You join CBS at first, late night comes in later, at first you are VP of daytime and children's programming. I, I, I have to, uh, I, I, I think I may have mentioned at various points, if I didn't, I will now, again, how Whatever our individual skills are, whatever our perceived talents are, etc., everybody needs a little help from some friends. Can't do it alone all by yourself. Mm -hmm. So 1982 comes along, and there's a strike, and I'm out of work. And I'm a young father with two young kids, and uh, I'd never been out of work before in my professional life, and it was very unnerving, and the beginning was okay. And my wife, to her great credit, sat me down and she said, look, you're going to be out for a while, you know that. It's not your fault. Um, we've been very conservative in our living and we're going to get by. It's not going to kill us. She says, you learn to be a father for a while. <laughs> and it was, a, it, was a, it was a wonderful leveler. It, it just it, it got my head out of dwelling on the lack of work. It was driving me nuts. And I finally decided, after a period of months, to call somebody. In the early 70s, there was a fellow who was the chief packaging agent at William Morris. No, before Mark Itkin. Chief packaging agent at the William Morris Agency, running daytime. And his name was Michael Ovitz. Oh, sure. Okay. And we got along famously, we had a great time working together, and his history is legion, and so I don't have to go through that now, spin our wheels here, but he at this point was the head of CAA in, the, in this midst of this strike. So I decided to call him up, which I did, got to him, explained the situation, and he said, look, Michael, he says, you know, this, this, this industry strike, he says, this won't be too long lived, he said, but one thing I want you to know. He said, um, you're wondering if I'm willing to help you? You have no idea how much I'm willing to help you. He then goes on to tell me what happened in the transition from William Morris to creative artists. A story I never knew. He said, when CAA was formed, it was created in a rush because we had been discovered by certain individuals at the William Morris office, and that was a heinous act to think of branching out, forming another agency. They all got thrown out. Five of them got thrown out that day on the street, and they weren't ready to start. And 
they scrambled to put themselves together as a business. A number of the William Morris talents went with them to CAA, but were still under contract to William Morris, so that any work that the CAA people would generate for them, the commissions would revert to William Morris until the contract ended. And they had financing put together for a certain period of time. And they had no income coming in for a number of months. And, and I don't know what the prescribed exact length of time was, but Ovitz told me it was running very close to the end when they got their first official commissionable show on the air, and it was for me. But I never knew it at the time. I never knew the significance of it. It was a game show called Rhyme and Reason. And that was their first package. And it saved them. I don't know so, the game, even. Uh, it's a variation on match game using rhyming words. Okay. Okay, I'll just leave it at that. It was on for about a year and a half, two years. Crazy Bill Nod. <laughs> I still talk to him. Yeah. Um, So Ovid said to me, he says, oh, you never had any doubt about whether I'm going to help you. He said, you saved our damn ass. He said, you're damn right I'm going to help you. And he set me up with Bud Grant at CBS. So this begins a lengthy run at CBS. Seven years. Uh, some great Seven successes. Seven great years. Wonderful mm -hmm. achievements in all the different day parts that you were involved with, yeah. really. Um, let's just, again, we're going to hit some high points. Let's talk about some of the great games of that period. Uh, you mentioned Pressure Luck earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, but that's okay. Pressure Luck is certainly one of them. No, you, you, you hinted at Pressure oh, okay. Luck. Oh, I hinted at it. Correct. Right. Um, Randy, would you like to take this? And well, it was Second show? Chance. Yeah. Uh, how did it end up? Uh, second Chance was a show that was on ABC for 18 weeks. Um, my boss never, it, when the pilot was done, okay, the test results on it were the highest of any game show I'd ever seen. Enough for me to get attention, not just because it received well, but I was saying to myself, there's an abnormal level of acceptance here. I want to know more about this. I, again, I never considered myself an expert in years, but I always made sure I interacted with the salespeople and understood how they approach the day part what their needs are. They're, this is all an integrated process. The research department is the same thing. I, I felt that they were imperative to getting some relatively objective feedback on whatever effort we're doing. Because when we're doing it, we're just too far into it, whether we're the executive or the producer, so far as for the trees situation. And um, when I saw those test results, uh, and I saw the show, it was a kind of a little disconnect for me. It was a good show, but I would never have expected to receive those kind of results. So, we put it on for 18 weeks because there was another show already committed to the time period that the show was going on, and there was no other place for it. And I told Bill Carruthers at the time, was, I said, you're going to have a short run here. I said, you got a short term to try and make this work. And I'm sorry for it, but that's the only reality, okay? So that happens. Boom, goes on, goes off. Cut, 1982, I'm at CBS. In walks Bill Carruthers. He says, okay, Chief. We didn't get a full chance at ABC there in the 70s. Is there anything we can do to reactivate your interest now? And I said, yes, because I remember those test results. And I said, yes, but... Here's the big but, and you're going to have to go away and think about how to do this. I said, we're now in the 80s, we're not in the 70s, and there's a lot more animation that goes on today in television. Things move at a faster pace. I said, you're going to have to rethink that format, maintaining a couple of the key ingredients, but you're going to have to figure a way to bring animation into that show. And I mean it literally. And they came back with the idea of the whammy and how it was used and the device with the kind of, that was Bill Carruthers' voice doing that character. And um, we did a pilot. Do you know the test results on the pilot were identical to the one at ABC? I never expected that, too. It wasn't as if people, oh, I remember that show. No, it was treated as a brand new show because we had changed enough. And it went on for, what, four years? I don't know. 
It's interesting. I looked at an episode of it in preparation to talk with yeah. you. The staging, at least, of the game, the way the set spins around the board, everything, it's dramatically similar. All right. you now, know, they, they really maintained a lot here, of that. I, I got to go back to another aspect of what you had asked earlier in the interview about where, how does the business needs, how do the business needs intersect with the programmatic needs? Okay. And uh, I, this is going to relate to Press Your Luck, but I want to preface it with another exchange that took place. When I was at CBS in the early days, they had a very structured environment with regard to the business department doing their job and the program department doing theirs. And I never quite always looked at things that way. I wanted to know what all the problems were because it always will come down in the end that I'll have to deal with them. And they were having some problem on the show and I was tr or a show and I was having trying to intercede on behalf of both parties and the head of business affairs called me in his office and he says close the door you and I got to talk okay Alan what is it he said you've got to come to understand here I know you've been here a short time but we take care of the business problems and you take care of the program problems do you understand and I said I understand your words but let me try and rephrase it a little bit because, Alan, every business problem that you have impacts the program. And every programmatic problem that I have intersects the business of the show, almost always. So we have to do it together. Do you understand me? <laughs> <laughs> we worked out a system. Okay, now we get to press your luck. We're going in to do the pilot and the estimates for the... Uh, to, to the degree that people may not remember, this is a big electronic board with a whole variety of elements that are rotating around on it, some with positive results if the contestants can stop on a good square, or they blows themselves up if they stop on the wrong square, and it's very exciting, and it, it's kind of like living in Vegas. And one of the key patterns, or the key elements of the show, was the light patterns of the changes of these, I forget how many boards 15. there were, 15 or so, 16 boards, something like that, because the center board was the face of the player. And the business people came down to me and said, Michael, the cost of these light patterns is enormous. Isn't there anything we can do to adjust it? I said, well, it's a pilot, okay? Do we have to go, I called Bill in. I said, I mean, in fairness, build it. You know, let's let's see if we can simplify the number of the patterns, bring the cost down, and we'll fix it if we're going, you know, correct it and, and amend it. And we're going to series. Okay, fine. So we do the pilot. Test results are great. It's going to go on the air, and we go now to try and get amending of the upgrading of the, and nobody would approve it. You don't need it. it Work fine in the pilot. You know. We go on the air. I don't know how many, how long we were on the air before a unique problem surfaced. And that is, and I cannot remember the guy's name, one of the contestants. Larson. Larson. Famous Michael Larson. Famous Michael James. Larson, yes. And I was home on a Saturday morning. They were taping. I had one of the, the other, one of my uh, members of my department was there. And I get this call from my, uh, and the department member, we have, we, have a, we have a problem right now. He said, I, I don't even know how to begin to describe for you what happened. And he said, and God, no, we don't have any idea what, the, what caused this or anything. And it was just total confusion. So Bill got on the phone, Carruthers. And he said, hi, Chief. Way. And did you know Bill? Yes, Okay. Very well. he, he was an ex-Marine, okay? And he's still acting like he's a general of the Marines. It, but it was his style. I'm not knocking. He was a great guy to work with. He was terrific. And very thorough, very detailed, and ran a very tight ship. And he said, I don't know what to tell you. He said, all I can tell you is we got a very long episode. <laughs> we have a contestant who went over $100,000 and broadcast standards that was refusing to give him his money because they said he cheated. And uh, we, we don't know what we're going to do. I, I, I sat down and said, wait a minute, somebody had better take me back from the beginning of what the hell happened here. Okay, so the, the show is divided in two halves, two identical halves. 
scoring was a little different, but the, 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 the two, four parts, a front game, an end game, a front game, and an end game, made up the half hour. The second part of the show, the second part of the front, the, 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 the end game, I'll call it, for the sake of simplicity of language here, was a, uh, wait, I'm not right about this. It was a front part and a second part of the game and a second half. And the second half of the, of the boy, I'm not doing this well. There was a front game in which you built up points and those turned into scoring opportunities on the board. And those were the two parts that made up one game. And then it was a second half of the same thing. In the first half of this episode, everything went normally. Three contestants, three or four, three. three, three contestants, and everything went normally. Come back to the second part, the quiz portion of it in which you generated your spins at the wheel went normally. Now this guy Larson gets control of the board at the start of the last quarter of the show. In the top center box, there was a, uh, a graphic that said you win either three, four, or five thousand dollars. It was a rotating number, and you get an extra spin if you can land on that box. Larson gets control of the board. <laughs> Boom! Stops on that box. Wins four thousand dollars. <laughs> Boom! Stops on that box. Wins five thousand dollars. This starts and starts and keeps going and keeps going and he's stopping on the same box. I don't know how many terms he did it. He ended up building up over $100,000 in their winnings. The other players are sitting there waiting for their turn. Nobody knows what the hell is going on. And he finally stopped landing on that box. So he became vulnerable and his hundred thousand dollars became vulnerable because if he had stopped on one of the whammy squares he'd have lost everything. So his task was get rid of the spins we had a, within the game structure he had the right to do. He would get rid of them to another player because he didn't want to spin anymore. Well they knew there was no way they were catching up to a hundred dollars so they passed them back to him and he passed them back. And this, this was going back and forth. It was hysterical and yet it was exciting as hell. He eventually won the game, he avoided the whammy, and he ended up winning over a hundred thousand bucks. But now the episode that was normally 30 minutes is, I'll make up a number, 80 minutes long. And the broadcast standards person of there freaked and just the, the guy has cheated. He, he's done something. He, he, he's found a way into the system. Well, it turned out what he had done this was still in the day of the VHS recordings. He was an out-of-work painter, I seem ice to remember. Cream. Ice, ice cream? cream? Salesman. Ice cream salesman, okay. I knew some along those lines. And he caught on to this game and he watched it and he started to realize the similarity of these light patterns. And so he started to record on VHF and then slow-mo down and he memorized the light pattern. So he came on the show with a knowledge of exactly where to start, stop the device and he was able to coordinate both his mental skill and his physical skills to make it work until fatigue, physical fatigue, stopped him from being able to do it and that's how he lost stopping on those boxes. So I hear this and I said put the broadcast standards person on. Now, now my promotion hat jumps into play and my financial hat jumps into play. We just have taped a show that's two and a half episodes long, given away a hundred thousand dollars and they don't want to give them the money and they refuse to let the show go on the air. So I said, put the park broadcast standards person on. And I spoke to her and I said, listen, I, I want to understand the logic of your decision making. I said, what did this guy do that makes it illegal? Why are you depriving him of his winnings? I said, he beat the system. He didn't do anything illegal. How can you deprive him of his money? What comes to give me some ammunition, some reason that makes sense and that conforms to our own guidelines and our own book of rules on the show? You know, what are you basing it on? No, they consented to give him his money. I said, okay. Now, if he didn't do anything wrong, 
why won't you let us put the show on the air? I said, we have problems and don't know how, how I'm going to do this, but I believe there may be a way to put these on the air, but we didn't do anything illegal. We ended up cutting it down to two episodes, and I got approval, and I put one on on a Friday, and the second one on on a Monday, and we got some very decent sampling and jump from Friday to Monday, and it became a big story, obviously, by the very nature of somebody beating the system. It was This is not a matter of uh, fixing games that, that occurred back in the 50s. This was just somebody who technically beat the system. And the reason he beat the system is because they wouldn't give us the money to improve the lighting patterns that were on the board. If they had, this would not have occurred. As I adjust the iris here, let yes. me, that's what I wanted to kind of speak with you about a little earlier. Is, and you, you've touched it, you brought it back full circle, of course. Um, here's an example. We haven't talked about standards and practices yet, yep. really, although you mentioned it just for a moment there mm -hmm. briefly. Here is an example. You have a game that you can take to pilot, but it's going to cost a lot of money to do it the right, the right way, so-called, whatever that means, to be, uh, to conform to the highest standard. Let's put it that way. And so, therefore, a decision financially is made to conform to a lower standard, and therefore, the gameplay becomes vulnerable to, to someone who is very observant and very clever. Oh, no, no, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're, you're making an assumption that isn't. isn't an assumption to make in this situation. Okay. At the time in which we were doing the pilot, it is not a show going on the air. It is a test version oh. of a show that will not go, but what I said to Bill was, look, I don't like having to do this, but if that's what it's going to take to get this done, let's do it as long as it will work for the pilot, and then we can revisit before, if we're going to air, what we are going to put on the air where it becomes both legally an issue and programmatically an issue. Very interesting point. So when you, when this arrangement was made, there was no assumption that it would go on the air in that form? Correct. Okay. Well, here, here is a question. that When one, pi one would pilot a game show... But nor there was any feeling of risk that something like that would happen. I mean, I Nobody sure. anticipated that. And by the way, Randy was a contestant on this program. Really? And a successful Ep episodes one. Episodes 9, 10, and 11. Wow, I, was, I didn't know that. I was retired when I uh, topped over 25,000 right. at the time. Right. Um, the first person who ever put two phrases together, big bucks and no whammies. You were the person who said that? He watched the first eight episodes uh -huh. and nobody ever put those two phrases Yeah, I don't remember them having been... Uh, advanced in the early stages of the show, so I knew it had evolved, but I didn't know how. And in the audience was a friend of mine, the uh, professor of film and television at UCLA, yeah. and at the end of episode 10, my second of three, we met in the parking lot, because that was the end of a tape day. Right. But, and he said, you know, there's patterns on that board. I've been sitting there in the audience. <laughs> and he said, now he tells me. <laughs> he goes to the left of the big bucks, he goes to the right of the big bucks, he goes down on the side, and then it's big bucks. And damned if he wasn't right, was I able to take advantage of it? Really no, not no, because no. it was way too nerve-wracking. No, I told you, this guy did a lot of homework on practicing. Yes, exactly. Before, which you didn't have any opportunity to do. Yeah. That was going to be my question as a, I was just a kid. But as a person watching at home, your perception of the board was that the board was random. As you, as a it, player, it was meant the, to be. In the fervor of the moment, despite I, your friends, I could who see that pattern. You could see it also. Okay. The other patterns I didn't know, no. or whatever, but occasionally I would see that happen. Okay. Well, there had to be some kind of a pattern to it yeah. at some point, well, no matter how, how many different uh, elements of the randomness there are. They're random okay. in how they occur. It's not a pre-programmed exact Was your intent sequence. to go to a full random generator? Or at what point? Uh, when you went to series. When we went to series, it was to go back and try, and, I, and we did do some upgrading of it but not to the full level that we had first thought we were going to be able to do when we first started. Yeah, if you had an open pocketbook, it would have been full right. Oh, yeah, sure. Because, it, it, it look, I was trained under a, you mentioned broadcast standards. The fellow who was in charge at ABC all the years, the, the, my early years, was a wonderful fellow named Al Schneider. His job at Root was very simple protect the licenses of the stations, the owned stations and the affiliated stations. 
He was a, directly reports to Leonard Goldenson, who was the head of ABC, ABC Inc., the owner. And he was a very imposing personality, a very dominant voice, dark, big voice, and very, you, 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 you were nervous when you went in to see him. So in the beginning, it, the idea of protecting those licenses for economic reasons was embedded in us. We understood it. Now, that can be a very constrictive force if it overwhelms you. You know it's there. You only deal with it when at times you say, I think I may be overlapping problems here, and I've got to really examine this. In the games, it became a particular issue only because of the history of the quiz scandals of the 50s. So the, in, the, the, the operating rule was you only present on the air what happened in real life in the studio. You don't rearrange anything. That's one of the problems we had with that pressure luck episode. We weren't rearranging anything, but we were able to lift out those things that didn't affect the outcome of the game to order to keep continuity and bring it down to two episodes. And that's how we were able to get approval to do it. But the, the idea of maintaining accuracy and consistency with regard to when you say the audience, this was a game that unfolded on that studio. It's what happened on that studio. You didn't reshoot or re-alter or do any of that. It was totally illegal. Maybe I have a misunderstanding. Perhaps you could clarify. When one provided pilot money for a pilot, yeah. one is therefore providing money to build a set. That's all part of network finance. So I presume that the money given to build the set, set. for the pilot yeah. It is presumed that one will build a set of the necessary quality to go on the air. Is that no, right? that is not That's true. That's not the case. That is not the case. So you would come back and... If you were knew in advance that you were putting the pilot on the air, you are absolutely right. There's a big, big step between doing a test episode that is not airing anywhere, it's not going out over the airways, for the purposes of testing it before an audience to see how it worked, than going to the real, you know, the major leagues and going on the air. There you have all of the other standards you have to apply. I wouldn't do a pilot in which somebody did something that was not conforming to doing it straight through as it's supposed to be. Because for me, I was testing not just the quality of the game, but the accuracy and the, and the, and the uh, 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 consistency of the format does the show really work. That's what I was testing in my own mind, in addition just to the basic game itself. So the test becomes a working tool. And we would establish budgets. You know, the producers would put together what they felt they needed to make this representation. And it was subject to the budgetary approvals of finance and business, uh, and business affairs because the business affairs people would make a, a licensing deal with the producer for the above the line for both the pilot, and then they had have to work out a series budget before, which was a fixed number for all the above the line elements. I mean, you had three components to the shows. You had the, the above the line elements, the, the, the prize elements, which the network controlled totally, and, uh, and the below the line. So from this perspective of what you've just told us, the fact that there was one version of the Press Your Luck board for the pilot, and that there would intended there was intended to be a different one later. It's not that unusual, Correct. really, from what you're telling us. Okay. I mean, it was not ideal. I wouldn't have, uh, but but there was a large gap of dollars. I don't remember what it was, but it was pretty significant. It wasn't a few bucks. And I said to myself, All right, am I going to cheat the ability to test the idea by reducing the number of light patterns on it? And I didn't think so. Mm -hmm. So it was worth going forward because I wanted to make sure that. I was going to get my money's worth for getting the idea realized that we had envisioned. When this is all over, and, and of course the tale of Michael Larson is a twice and thrice told tale, but your perspective on it is unique. When this is all over and now the network has to pay out a lot of money because in part of a decision that was made to save money in the beginning, is there finger pointing and blame? No. Or is no. it pretty much... Not for me. I don't mean from you, I mean just in no. general. No, okay. remember. Between the time in which that pilot was made and when Michael Larson happened, it was a couple of years. Yeah. 
So you'd make plenty of money in the meantime. It's not a matter of making money, but I mean, the, yeah. the, making a, a, a link between the cause and effect is too far apart for anybody to know. Mm -hmm. Randy, uh, 82 to 87 CBS, any games of that period you'd like to talk about specifically or you have thoughts about, queries about? Jay Wolpert's uh, Blackout. Uh, yeah. Did you, uh, Hugh, was that CBS? Hugh, Hugh was, was CBS, CBS, but that preceded my time at CBS. I think I was at NBC at the time when he did Few. Jay, Jay is, is a fascinating, fascinating guy. Extremely bright, very creative guy. And I had said to Jay, and I, so I'm not saying anything out of school here, but I haven't said to Jay. I, I said, you know, you always come in with interesting ideas. They're challenging, they're creative, they're complicated, which can work for or against you. He said, but I'm going to be investing in you because I believe that you're going to find something big someday. And I want to be there to be the receiver. To encourage him, not to discourage him. Regarding um this period, am I recalling correctly, I'm not sure, am I recalling correctly that the Ray Combs version of Feud went on during your tenure? Yes, it did. On CBS. Yes. So this is a game with which you've had a previous association. Mm -hmm. Now it's coming back with a new MC. Uh, he's a man who does not, again, does not have an MC background at that point. What are your memories just generally of developing the new Feud? Well, I don't think the format changed in bringing it back. But I do remember something I want to mention to you that I forgot to mention, which I think has some significance. You at one point had talked about, did Feud go to CBS first? And I said to you, I don't know. I don't have any recall of it, but it could have, and I might not have known it, but I am going to find out, because it's such an interesting question. But when we had committed to a pilot of doing Family Feud, I had to get approvals from a couple of people to go forward. It was an odd arrangement during their at ABC at that time. And usually with Goodson, when the daytime buyer would see something and they liked it and they would give them a pilot commitment there because if they were, had the authority and they knew going over what their needs were and whether this in any way fit it, they could give them a pilot commitment subject to the business working out. And in my case, I couldn't give that unilaterally. I had to get approval at that point from what I thought was one individual, and turned out it was two, and I wasn't getting an answer. And the intervening period between the time that I saw the run-through and the answer that I could give them was not happening. Three days go by, four days go by, and I'm getting calls from them saying, What's going on, Michael? What's going on? Well, I finally said to Jerry Chester, I said, look, I'm begging you, don't do anything foolish on my behalf right from it. I will get you an answer by date, day X at the end of the day. And he said to me, Michael, because we were very good friends, Jerry and I, and I he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going up there and just confronting them and I'm going to get an answer. I said, I'm not going to sit like this. I'm not going to be put in the back of the bus like this. No way. He goes, too much at stake, not just the show, but our relationship. I said, it just, all right. So the day of morning, of, of the, that date that I said came, was coming, there's nothing happening. No one's calling me, nothing. I'm about an hour away from going upstairs. Oh, and what Jerry had said to me, he said, Michael, if we don't hear from you today, we're going to be taking it to CBS. So whether that was true or not, I tend to think it wasn't. Because if they had already shown it to CBS, they either could have said they were going to show it to ABC and NBC at the same time, which very well may have. Because remember, it didn't resemble Family Feud at that point. It was, it was a different game. So, but they didn't usually shotgun like that. They were a little more selective and waited to get a response before they went to the next one. So I can't believe that CBS would have passed and then they would have gone back to CBS. But I remember him saying to them, they're going to go to CBS. No, I know what it was. I know what it was. It just hit me. They went to NBC first, and it was passed on. 
That's what it was. But just remember the circumstance. Okay. So that's why they then were going to, to, to CBS. No, I'm saying they, that NBC had seen it in this form that I had seen it and didn't react to it the way that I reacted to it. That happens. So I doubt they went to CBS first. The CBS was going to be their last call for, for whatever reason. Probably it was because the CBS didn't really have a time period availability. I don't think it was anything other than the practical realities. Okay. So I waited and I wasn't getting an answer and I was getting geared up now to create, I know, what was not going to be a pleasant moment, but I had a responsibility to do it. And just as I'm getting ready to gear up, in comes Michael Eisner to say, okay, go ahead, the Goodson Show. So we were within an hour or so of losing the show. And you think about the ramifications if that had gone to CBS and not just of the financial benefit of that show, but what benefit it threw off to the other shows, et cetera, the whole day part. I mean, you know, the history of ABC Daytime goes back to a show called, to their elevation into a realistic competitive position, was a show that was on NBC called Let's Make a Deal. Oh, that's right, and Hall moved it because NBC wouldn't agree to some demands that he had about some. A friend of mine who had worked in daytime was a good friend of Monty's, and and Monty had the show at NBC, and Monty was up for term renewal, and said to NBC that one of the conditions of renewal is a half hour prime time. And NBC put a game show on in prime time, not a chance. And they didn't think he'd walk. And he did, and it destroyed NBC for years and made ABC's daytime. So sometimes what may be simple, seeming simple decisions are not so simple and with some serious ramifications. Um, the business that of what I did with Mark that day about um, I'll give you a pilot if you don't come to the stage till it's ready. If I did not have that relationship with him during those days between the time they presented the show and the day I finally got the answer, they'd have been gone already. But that relationship was the key to that staying there until I gave them an answer. It was never, never addressed, but I've realized that in hindsight that that's what it was. You, because you had such successful and you were so prolific at CBS with so many important, uh, I think, accomplishments, we can only just touch a few. But let me just throw out a few things sure. and just get your thoughts. Uh, and whatever you have to throw in, toss it in. I have heard you mention, and it was never expressly stated, that you had some involvement with Jack Barry during that period. Yeah. And which... And I don't know exactly, supposedly, if I understood you right, that he had been involved with a, a, a pilot that... I know the story you're referring ...was to. not exactly kosher or something no, like that. No, 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 no. Let me clarify that. There was nothing okay. illegal involved well, in any way that. whatsoever. I guess by nature but by of the, pilot, that's it the would be illegal, right? Yeah. No, no. I, I'll yeah. explain to you what the circumstance was. First of all, you, you know the history. I don't want to go into that with 21 and the... And the, and the um, uh, what happened to that in the 50s is one of the key shows in the, in the uh, scandal. Um, my predecessor, before I joined CBS, had committed to three pilots, uh, one of which was a redo of 21. And uh, Jack and Dan Enright, Jack Berry and Dan Enright were partners, and they were the ones who actually, it was Bud Grant at CBS who put them back in business after all those years, who fed, uh, they've suffered enough. You know, they're deserving of going back. So. Here I am at CBS, and the three pilots, one was with Bob Stewart, I, one was the Goodson uh, Child's Play show, which I put on, and uh, the third one was 21. And I got, the, the sh 21 was going to the stage within days after I joined CBS, so no idea what they had done to it. Well, I had all of these three pilots cold. I had no prior knowledge of what the workings of the shows were. And I get to the stage, and I watch that what they seem to be doing is producing a sales presentation. They're doing bits and pieces 
and Jack is in the control room and Danny's out on the floor. And, you know, my first reaction was, I must be wrong. There must be some ele element here that they're working on that's not. Well, after about 10, 15 minutes, I realized my instincts were right. That's exactly what they're doing. They're not trying to conceal it. And so I just looked at Jack and I just went like this. Let's go out in the hall and talk. And I went out in the hall and I said, Jack, you, of all people, know the sensitivity related to doing this show again. So the first test that I am going to examine is, does the format work really? What Danny's doing on the floor here will not prove that test, therefore you will not go on the air. What? I mean, Jack was so... I said, you've got a day and a half to correct the situation. But I am either going to see a real half hour of this format presented so that I can really determine what the inherent strengths of it is or is not, or we're going nowhere. He deserved hearing that from me. So they, they scrambled and got things together and did a straight format of it, but they, they were planning to do this as a sales presentation, thinking it would be enough for us, because they were so imbued in the, in the, in the uh, syndication market at that time, they could get away with that. No one in syndication would be asking them questions like we would ask about a format of a show. And what did you mean here? It's a, it's a sales piece. So they were doing what was natural to them for the market that they had been in. So it was corrected, and then that was the encounter. With what was the background on Joker's Wild? That was CBS, wasn't it? But that was in the early 70s. That was one of the first games they put back on. They, they had in the mornings, the first three half hours, um, three situation comedies that were coming off the air. It was somewhat akin to the situation when I joined CBS in 82. There were two comedies on the air that were coming off the air. And because um, they were committed to going into syndication. So Bud, who came over from NBC, he was the, uh, I think he was director of daytime at NBC, he came over to a a a a CBS as the VP in charge. He had three half hours to fill. Now, what did he end up doing? Joker's Wild, Gambit. Price is Right, and Gambit. Not a bad three choices. Um, and, um, uh, and that's what got them into the game business and succeeded and knocked off NBC in all three half hours. In the time frame of uh, Jack Barry, this was yeah. after the 21. The 21 was in the 50s. This was the Joker's Wild was the return of Jack but and Dan on the air. What I'm just talking about, Bud put them back on the air then. That was the first time that they had been back on the air since the scandals. The 21 Jack and Dan were doing was before Joker's Wild. Way, 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 way. Not, not, not the 50s. Oh, the, no, no. The 21 didn't go back on the air until years later on NBC in prime time. 2000. Oh, the way after all of this, yeah. So the pilot that Jack did for you didn't sell? Correct. Okay, sure. I see. But that was... The one he was doing that was a sales. Well, they started out in their rehearsals. Right. To, that, that I could tell they were putting together a sales pitch. That was before Joker's Wild. No, that was in no. the eighties. No, 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 no. Sequence. You had the scandals in fifty with twenty one. In seventy two, Jack was put back on the air in Joker's Wild, big success. They then. Um, there's another show that. They did in syndication. I'm not getting my exact sequence in. Probably Tic Tac Doe. Tic Tac Doe went on CBS and then went into syndication. That's correct. Um, and the Tic Tac Doe was also before I joined in 82. Yeah, absolutely. And um, then came that attempt to bring 21 back in 82 and then NBC put it on in prime time and uh, for a short time in the 90s. Yeah. So in sort, of, in sort of wrapping this up, let me just throw out a couple names. Give me a yeah. sentence or a paragraph, whatever you want, about these people. Uh, one, obviously, over your shoulder there, Bill Cullen. One of the classiest human beings I've met. Great MC. He, I can only say it this way. When Bob Stewart would present a show, 
you knew that the rule was if Bill Cullen was available, Bill was doing the show. There was no question about it. He had that high regard for Bill's ability, and it was deserved. Uh, we never, we not, not even mentioned his name. Did you have any acquaintanceship with Bill Todman? No, not really. Um, Bill's role in the company, you, you got to go back to the history of the business. In the early years of network television, when the Goodson name, Goodson Todman name was a factor with what's my line and I've got a secret to tell the truth. Those were days in which shows didn't get bought directly by the networks from the producers. The pilots were sold to advertisers and advertising agencies and the agencies would then decide on where they wanted to place it and go over to the networks and try and work out a deal to get the shows placed. So the networks were just the really distributors at that point. Um, Bill and, and Mark got together where Mark was the real creative genius of the company and Bill was the salesman. He was the one that took the ideas over to the agencies and made deal with the agencies. So by the time I came into play in the business, the business had changed and the agency people, because of the nature of how sales were made in daytime, in which it was all spot buying, that routing got changed and it was directly from producers to the networks and Bill was really not a factor in it and he was sort of just about retired at that time. I'm going to throw out a game a name, nothing to do with games at all, but very important in children's television. And this goes to the topic of political interest groups and parent mm -hmm. activity. I'm trying to think of which of the two names you're going to Parent activism. And that is a lady, if you're of the generation I am from, no, and you loved all that stuff, she was much vilified. Uh, and that's Peggy oh, Chair. Peggy Chair. Absolutely. I, I got along very well with Peggy. I ah. loved her. She was terrific. She was a thorn in our side, but she was coming from the right place. So you regarded her highly. She's not an enemy. Not an enemy. Not an enemy. Okay. She was a, um, a truth teller that we had to, we, we really needed to listen to. Who was the other name you were going to say? Oh, I thought you were going to two talents that were somewhat provocative at the times that we did them two shows. If you're going to get into any of the shows, I will hold back because you may mention them. But if not, I will you tell you. You mean kids shows? Yeah. Or, um, well, I like to name a few shows. Okay. Let me just throw out a couple of other production names in the kids' sure. television business. Ruby Spears, Ken, Joe Ken and Ken Joe, Spears. sure. Terrific guys. I love, they're, they're very creative guys, very bright. They worked at, at, uh, 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 under uh, Joe Barbera for a HB, while, sure. and uh, by the way, there, there was nothing more interesting than having Joe Barbera in your office trying to pitch a show. It was fascinating. It was a show in itself. Um, the but 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 Ruby and Spears were particularly good with comedies. Did you have much interaction in pitching with the Croft Brothers? <laughs> Indeed. Their first show that they did, H.R. Uh, Puffin stuff, was sold to NBC when I was at ABC. Um, they had never been in the television production business. They had, and, and live action on, on, on Saturday morning was almost non-existent to my, my knowledge. It probably was at that point. But what they were doing is really a combination of animation and live action anyway, even though it was really in live action. But they got a budget for the series and blew the entire budget after the first episode. <laughs> And they had big financial problems with NBC. And they came over to us. I don't remember if ours was the second show they did or the third. I think it was the second. They came over to us with a show called Lidsville. I say us because I was the director. I was not the VP in charge when that came over. And I mean, I remember going over to the studio to see the representation. I mean, obviously, it was a script, but but to see the elements of artwork that they would have for it, Sid and Marty were. Oh, uh, I mean, it's just incredible to work with. Incredible. Boring. You will never have to worry about. In those, and they were very different personalities. In those years when you dealt with children's programming, uh, did you have to deal very much with outside? educational, academic, consultant types who often got involved to sort of put their imprimatur on well, programming? yes, the answer is yes. Once we got into the area of having some informational slash educational dimensions to whatever we're doing, 
we felt the need to bring educators into play to give some guidance, not so much for direct editorial oversight of individual scripts, although that it eventually and sometimes it worked that way. And I'm having the, um, the name of the school in New York that we dealt with so thoroughly. I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the institution. There was a fundamental institution, something School of Education in New York, well, my memory is ser not serving me well on this one. But they were terrific to work with, and they would provide. They provided us really with the kind of beginnings of the formation of the after-school specials, and, and searching out areas for us to pursue. Um, this, they were they all did oversight on the um, um, Scholastic Rock series, Bank Street, Bank Street College of Education, okay. was this, was the place that we dealt with, um, and uh, they were they were terrific to work with. Okay. It, it became. An interesting combination. I'm going to mention a couple of names of kids' yeah. programs that you were involved with as an executive. And if you remember anything or nothing, just say nothing. Uh, during the CBS years, Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> um, a woman was VP of Children's who reported to me. Her name is Judy Price. I knew Judy from a CBC days. And when an opening occurred at CBS, I wanted Judy. I knew she was a mixed bag in some respects, and I'll explain what I mean by that, because it's really not negative. But she was a fierce fighter for her beliefs, and I respected that. I, I didn't get ch thrown by that. And when she came in with the Dungeons and Dragons, I had misgivings. I had misgivings about using it as a theme. I understood its marketing values, and that wasn't the issue, but its subject matter. I was somewhat troubled by it. She tried to assure me that we would not have any problems. She knew what to do, and I trusted her. And so I gave her a head, and we did it. And we didn't run into too many problems with the show. There were a few comments and so forth, but uh, nothing overly dramatic. Again, I don't know. You, you have such a clear memory. You may recall yeah. all this stuff. The Get Along Gang. The Get Along Gang I have no recall of whatsoever. I don't remember having done it. Okay. Was where, during, was during where was that? Where was that? CBS during the, your tenure, at least. You may You're not have been sure? involved. Well, in, in my dates, it is. Yeah, yeah. May have been bought by someone else just as you came in, or something. Could have. I think it's early '80s. Early, um, early '80s. Well, I started in '82. That's what I'm saying. I think it goes on around that time. No, so then it probably preceded my. Yeah. Uh, um, you mentioned in your list of credits, and it's very beloved, Muppet Babies. Yes. Again, I got to give all the credit to Judy. She was the one that came up with that idea with Margaret Lesh when they, when they were together at Marvel, and um, both Margaret and Judy were terrific. And the whole idea of doing the Muppets was instantaneous. What, what's not to, who's not going to react to doing that? But then they came up with that unique angle of doing them at a low level. We're seeing a variation on that going on in prime time this year with the young Sheldon from The Big Bang Theory. <laughs> You know, you find this character for a particular time in his life. Well, what happened back here? So we'll see. Uh, they should only they should only have the success that Muppet Babies had, and so another, or the Big Bang Theory has. Another yeah. revered series, many great voice actors, um, Garfield and Friends. Now, okay, Garfield. Well, first of all, Garfield existed at CBS in prime time before I came, I believe, or was there. But my specials, responsibility, yeah, it was a specials, exactly. It was in the specials area. We ended up finally convincing, um, creator's name I'm blanking on. Jim Davis? Yeah, is it Jim? Yeah, yes. uh, to do it for Saturday morning. He was very reluctant to do it. He was nervous for good reasons, but it was eventually we did, Judy convinced him and got him to do it for Saturday morning. And, as I said, she didn't give up. When she had something in mind, fierce and fighting for it and not giving up easily. Do you have any memory of Hey Vern, It's Ernest? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, we can't hit a home run every time. Well, I thought it was charming. I know it was. Jim Varney, right? right. Jim Varney, the actor. He's just great. I heard a very cute story related to that, by the way, which I will tell you, unrelated to the areas, but it was a result of that show. Um, Judy came to me with, he was very popular in the commercial series at the time. 
dairy and, products yes. of some kind. And so she said to me she wanted to do this, and she showed me what they had in mind. And I, it was a flyer. We really, we had no way of knowing what we would get. Um, one of the executives on it, oh, Michael, my names, names are my weak spot these days. Guys, I'm sorry. Age does do that to you. Um, Marty, Barbara Streisand's manager. Marty begins with E. Um, Ehrlichson, okay? Marty Ehrlichson. Was also Jim Barney's manager. And so he told me this story. I asked him, I said, how did you ever get hooked up with Barbara Streisand? And he started to laugh, and he told me. Many, many years before, when he was an agent, young agent at the William Morris office, the group of the agents was supposed to go down to a club in the village to see a couple of young comics. So they went down to see the comics perform, and the acts had finished, and he decided to hang around. And out comes this 16, 17, 18-year-old singer. And he listens to her for I don't know how long, not very, and she blew his mind. He went backstage, and he talked to her and told her who he was and that he wanted to take over if she didn't have anybody. And she says, no, I have an agent at the moment. And he handed her a card, and he just said, look, you hold this card. If for any reason, at any time, you need my help, you call me. He was not going to try and impose himself over another agent. Months go by, late at night, he's at home, and he gets a call. Marty, it's Barbara. I'm in Pittsburgh, and I'm here for two weeks at a hundred bucks a week, and they want me to stay two more weeks, and they ask them for two hundred bucks, and they won't do it. Can you help me? He said, hang up the phone. I'm getting dressed, I'm coming to Pittsburgh, and I will take care of it. And they became lifelong friends, and he managed her for the rest, except for a short period of time when she was involved with John, um, well, producer. There, there was a short period in which... Peters. There, yeah, John Peters. That, there were, that Marty's relationship there ended, and then he came right back as soon as that ended. But it just goes to show you about where your instincts are and without necessarily only thinking of good fortunes ahead, just in thinking of terms of you're doing your job to the best of your ability, you see something that says you need to go after this or you need to do this, don't give up. That's the best advice I can give to the talented, the young talents of today. Let's hit two points to close. Yeah. And the second to last one is, you note in 1989, you rejoined ABC as president yep. of a separate division, yep. daytime children's and late night yes. programming. You leave a fairly short time later, yep. citing philosophical differences with upper management, those above you, I suppose. Obviously, you're upper management, but those uh, in superiority to you. That's true. That is true. That is what true could state. you say about that? Because I don't like, I don't like, I never in any conscientious way lied to the press. Mm -hmm. Didn't believe in doing that. Mm -hmm. They were too important to you in many ways to do that. Or the public. Um, none of us are perfect. None, oh my God, I just recognized that picture up in the corner for God's sake. Chancellor? BB. Oh, that's Chancellor. I, from, and, and with my lousy eyes, I thought it was someone else. Forget it. Okay. Of course. Morrow. Yeah, Morrow. That I understand. Mm -hmm. um, none of us are immune from making mistakes. When I took over ABC at the time, the daytime schedule was very well uh, entrenched with the uh, All My Children, One Life to Live in General Hospital and they needed supervision, but they were doing very well. There was an hour in the morning from 11 to 12 in which they were doing a show called The Home Show. And well-intentioned, uh, the version of it is still on the air today on uh, uh, the Hallmark Channel. Um, 
Woody Fraser, I, I give him a lot of credit, a very talented producer who managed to take this format and resell it and resell it and retweak it, and that, that's, that's not easy. Okay. It was an expensive show and not performing particularly well. And its audience levels were demographically okay, but not great. But I felt there was room for improvement. And my plan was to work on a few game shows, but of a special type. Remember, I said at one point to you that the profiles of the networks are a little different. And I knew enough about them now, having worked at all three and having studied them, what those differences were. And are, by the way, even to today. Not quite as distinctive, but they're still there. So I knew what type of games we would go for in programming. Now, obviously, I can't do anything until I have the parts that I want to go with. So we try to work on the home show and work with my associate, Mickey, and, and, uh, and Woody. But when the management got wind of what I was planning to do, they freaked. Because they said, you know, we don't do game shows. They're, they're old skew. They're going to play just to an older audience. And I said, I can understand why you make that assumption, but it's not necessarily true. I said, remember, guys, I was trained here in the early years. And I know what the audience profile of this network and its affiliates are. So there are, just like in any form, there are different types within the form. And I know the kind to do. It may take me a little while. They just didn't want to hear of it. And I really found that philosophically unwise. It put blocks on me. And, oh, and one of the comments made, I won't attribute it to the individual because of its insanity, but he said to me, why don't you just go out and find us another Oprah? <laughs> How do you respond to that? You leave. Which you did in 1991, right. and the although you're still working, you're still you're yeah. still developing and pitching today. But as far as being an executive, uh, the last point on the line you want to mention is that you worked for three years for Mark Goodson's Mark Goodson. company right. yes. after your long relationship with yep. Goodson, and you worked there until he became infirm and had well, it went until he sold the company. Yeah. Yeah. So to talk about your years with Mark Goodson's company. You mean those years, or those, you mean those, just overall? Those, those three years, yeah. Well, it was a transitional time. They, they were, the business climate had changed, the environment about um, available time periods and what the networks were doing and what was going on. And, um, and Jonathan then, his son, who was sort of spearheading the company, was taking it in a slightly different direction, but he was trying to be realistic to react to the marketplace and the marketplace needs. So you really, it's not, it was not the same kind of environment that existed there in the 70s uh, and 80s and, and of course all the years before it was even different. And so it was a real struggle. Um, and my role there was to sort of fill the role that uh, fellow Jerry Chester had, had re I was replacing him more than anything, which was sort of straddling, uh, guiding the business course of the company and its creative direction. But in a collaborative way with the troops that were there. So. Uh, we had some struggles, and we did a few things that didn't quite work. Some the, the revival of a match game went on. Actually, no, the match game was when I was at ABC. I bought it there, a match game, and it did not do well. Ni in late 1991, somewhere around there. Um, and um, the, there was a situation where both the format and the MC didn't quite mesh together, and we didn't get the match game that's on the air now on ABC. Sure. Uh, Alex has done a terrific job. He's, Alec, I should say. Um, uh, is he as good as Gene was? No. Gene, it was a format made for Gene. He brought a lot to the table for that show, a lot. When he would read those setups, he did it with such style and panache and such I mean, it was a wonderful setup for the panelists. Uh, here again, these panelist shows, they're very different today, what's on the air. Uh, to Tell the Truth is a different show than what the original show was. It's now made more of a comedy show than it was there as a pure game. Um, 
Feud is the same format and Pyramid are the same formats. Um, but Match Game, the key to the success of a Match Game format, and by that I mean where there are panelists, is the ability to have the time to build the panelists both individually in terms of their skill at knowing how to play the game and play the game. Knowing that there are two levels, the humor and the real game. There's a real game going on and you gotta play the real game. Um, and how to do that in a way that is almost unnoticeable to the audience. Um, there's no time for the developing of those ensemble groups. They don't just all of a sudden, you don't just cast and put them in place. You have to develop the individual talents and the skills of those talents to get the format fully realized for the humor to come out of it in a very natural way. Sometimes it has a feeling of being forced and some of them are not as good as others because they don't know how to play the game. Um, and it's a very delicate balance. When What's My Line started they did not have the panel that became the huge success. They started with a few clunkers, and they had the luxury of time to be able to weed those out that didn't quite work and bring in others that did, and finally found the chemistry amongst the group that they needed for it to succeed. And same thing happened with Match Game. The Match Game of the 70s was not the Match Game of the 60s. What they did in the 70s was magical. And to the guys who were responsible for that is a great success. In those last three years when you worked for Goodson, how integrally involved was he at that point? Was he still very actively involved? Um, not exactly. Somewhat diminished because of his illness. But when he was engaged, you got the full Mark Goodson. Mm -hmm. And you were involved with the development of GSN? To a degree. The original uh, idea of doing a game network was planned by two entities. Sony for one and the Family Channel for another. The then Family Channel. and. Both of them knew that without the Goodson Library, it would be almost impossible to start up an entity. So they both tried to win over the Goodson company to be a partner and participant in the channel. And the nature and the structure of the presentations clearly lent itself to going with Sony. So Sony and Goodson were partners in the show, not equal partners, but just Goodson had a substantial uh, uh, investment in it. And the interesting thing about it, uh, say for me, as part of my career there, was in getting all of these old shows brought to a point where Sony could use them technically was a real challenge. And, to the credit of uh, Charles Kappelman, who was uh, head of the CBS production facility, he figured out how we could do it. They still have the unit together that does that kind of conversion of these old kinescopes to, to take current formats, uh, which was unbelievable. When you would see one of these old kinescopes with all the old lines of the television transmission in this picture, go through that process and come out on a on tape is absolutely pure black and white shows that looked like they were pristine and brand new, other than the fact they're not in color. Um, it was amazing. But there were after constraints on the use of all those shows. The language in the after contract that was existent at that point stipulated that all, um, what's the term they used? I'll use a, supplemental, supplemental markets. markets. I was going to say after markets. So supplemental market usage required the approval of all the talent. And after was in our building. Where, the Goodson were. where was Goodson located at that time? Uh, on Wilshire. Um, courtyard. The, the courtyard. Is it the yeah. same building where the after is still? Probably. No, Could it be. Across right. the street down. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so I went over there and I said, explain this paragraph to me. Is this what I think it means? And we talked through, and they said, yeah. I said, well, 
there are millions of questions that I'm asking. You're saying to me that in essence, if I take a panel show and I have the approval of the, I have a deal with the MC and I have approval with three of the four panelists and one panelist for whatever reason doesn't want to do it, we can't use it, right? Now we had a guarantee to Sony that we would deliver X number of episodes. And it took me over a year to get all of this done. And I went through some fascinating discussions with some of the older talents about what this was all about, what it would mean. And of course, the other thing was, the residuals, you could count in your change pocket as to what they would get as a residual for these usage. So I realized this was not going to entice them to want to do it. And there was no formula for any pay scale for this, other than those residuals. So I had to create a whole new pay pa format for it. And the MCs were the same thing. If an MC didn't want to do it, the show was dead. And I said to myself, there has to be a way to do this that is equitable. So we, I figured out a rate, a, 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 a particular rate, that would apply to every episode that they were involved in, so that there was not equal payment to them. It was tied to the lengths of shows, number of shows that we were using of the talents. And I had to negotiate with Fred, Fred good old Fred Wasberg, who was one step ahead of me. Realized what I was going to have to do. He signed up all the talents ahead of me. So every time I would call, I'll call Bob Eubanks and say, "Bob, I need to." He says, "Talk to Fred." And the next one, call, talk to Fred. <laughs> well, in some ways, it made it easier, and not, but it was very smart on his part to do that. Um, and um, uh, I remember one MC in particular who was very thorny. He, he turned me down a number of times. He didn't want to know about it. Just didn't want it. And I said, okay, I'm taking him and I'm putting him to the end of the line. Not out of any reason of anger. I, I respected his position. I didn't agree with it, but I respected it. But I wasn't going to just throw out the show because there were a number of shows involved. I'll wait till the end. So I got everything else done. And I went back to this individual. And I said, all right, look, we've talked. I've told you before what this deal is. I'm telling you now, I've got more than enough tapes to go forward with the channel. You have no leverage. I don't mean this as a threat. I just mean it as a statement. I got nowhere to go. We were on a, um, uh, another term getting away from me, where everybody's playing on the same level field. Favorite, Favorite, Favorite Nations. Nations, thank you. Boy, glad he was here. Yes, that's Favorite, why I like to have him here. Favorite right. Nations agreement, and everybody's getting the same thing. You know, at the same dollar, but for the value of your performances in these shows, you will see X dollars. You're not going to see it on these shows ever again. This is the last time. And I said, I have no reason to hang up and wait for you because I don't need these shows. I would like to include them uh, from a historical perspective, but I'm not getting anything for them. At least, if I include your shows, I'm not getting any more than I would if I don't include them. And it took me a couple of times to talk to him and he finally consented. So we got all of the shows. But the most fascinating discussion of all was Steve Allen. I called Steve and explained the circumstances to him. He was fine, but he didn't want to end it there. He wanted to know more. He had the most curious mind you've ever human being you've ever met, coming at it from a real interest. And he started asking me all the questions about how does this work? What are you doing here? How does this, and how is this going to work? He wanted to know everything, how it's going on the air, where it's going to be. and. and there was, it was an hour conversation I had with him that was unbelievably delightful. Randy, is there anything you want to ask about Goodson during those years to close up? Once you've seen Napoleon's desk at a Picasso, <laughs> what else is there to ask? <laughs> you want to talk about Mark a little bit? No, he was a complicated personality, okay? Um, I will say this to you, and it's, and it's in a note of sadness more than anything else. Here was an enormously wealthy, extremely successful individual who never fully embraced his own success. He was a very sad man in many ways. 
And I just felt so badly for that. A unique talent, uh, I mean, uh, an intellectual of, of great depth. And uh, his greatest skill, by the way, in my judgment, having watched them, I talked to you earlier about the two key things about conception and execution. He was very good at conception, but he was brilliant at execution. His notes, his observations went from the most key point to the littlest of points. Every, nothing escaped his observation and his review. Is this being done the right way? Did we try everything else? He was never giving up until in his mind it had reached its maximum potential before he would do it. So that their success to a great extent was in that kind of detail. And that's the way he trained his people. I mean, they just absorbed it by nature of sitting around and, and hearing that. And, and the, the diversity of talents. So there, my, the fellow I work with, Bob Noah, worked for them for a number of years in the early years. It was very close to Mark. And he and I still Mark at different phases of our life. But it is, it was an incredible education. That, as well as a professional experience and with good rewards for the people that were there. Anything else on any other topic? I got thousands. It's <laughs> enough. Okay. The last two questions would be then when did you become a member of the Pioneer Broadcasters and who was your original sponsor? Very good question. Do you know I'm not sure? Oh. I believe that my sponsor was Rick Ross, but because uh, I know he was in the organization before me. And, but I have a very fuzzy memory of when there was. It was somewhere in the 90s, early 90s, I seem to remember. Um, uh, early to mid-90s, I believe that's when I joined. Mm -hmm. So it's been a, it's been a, a joyful, very uh, terrific experience in the, the diversity of the, of the experiences of the people at work that are in the organization, whether they were below the line or above the line, writers, producers, performers. It's, it's a collection of some fascinating and, and, and uh, uh, interesting people. You have been so kind. You've been such a stalwart in doing all this with us. And I think outpaced even Tom Kennedy in length of conversation. And I know it's a, a great challenge psychologically. Thank you for doing it. It's my pleasure. And I'm looking forward to see the results. And then I'll go like this. <laughs>